Hello, my name is Narelle M. Harris and I am here today with Brimbank Libraries to talk to you about my new book, which is an anthology I edited called The Only One in the World, a Sherlock Holmes Anthology. This anthology, this project happened because I've been um, a great fan of the Sherlock Holmes stories for about 30 years now. Um, I actually never used to much like uh, the, some of the TV and film representations, but 30 years ago, I saw a TV series of Sherlock, The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Jeremy Brett, which was produced by the Granada TV series. And it was so different from all the preceding stories that I'd seen, and it was just full of such sharpness and wit, and you know, the friendship was really equal, John Watson wasn't completely stupid and Holmes wasn't all arrogant and aloof. You know, there was there was this really nice balance of the, the characters and I was interested about where that dynamic had come from. Um, and so I went back to the original stories by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and was delighted and surprised to find how beautifully written they were, what great energy and verve they have, um, and how, you know, some of them are really funny, some of them have got this creeping sense of horror, there's always these curious uh, and bizarre mysteries to be solved, and this great friendship between these two men who, like great friends do, sometimes have a little dig at each other, but are there to support each other as well. Um, and, you know, through John Watson narrating the stories, we get to look at his brilliant friend who he so admires, but we also get to understand a little bit about John Watson himself, and from time to time, when Sherlock has been teasing him a little bit too much, John Watson, only occasionally, but from time to time gets a little of his own back, which is always kind of fun. So, you know, there's a good balance between the two of them. So I have been a huge fan of those characters and those mysteries ever since then, because, you know, basically who doesn't want a best friend that you go off and have adventures with? I've read a lot of Sherlock Holmes stories over the years and I've written a number myself. Uh, but the idea for this anthology came from the idea of looking around um, at the different kinds of fans and readers of the Sherlock Holmes stories, the people who are involved in fandom and write fan fiction as well. And I began to think about the idea of what would Sherlock Holmes have been like if he came from a different culture, if he hadn't been, um, you know, a white middle-class Englishman of the Victorian era. We do see some of that sometimes. BBC Sherlock brought him up to date. Shows like um, Elementary in the US give us a, a Japanese-American Watson, who's a woman. Uh, so that's different again. We, uh, the ja uh, Japanese series Miss Sherlock, gives us a female Holmes and Watson in the modern era, um, you know, obviously uh, an homage to BBC Sherlock as well as the original stories. But I wanted to see something a bit more cohesive on that ground, a bit more um, in depth. So I thought of, uh, so I spoke to my publisher at Clandestine Press and said, look, I'd really like to do an anthology of Holmes and Watson and what they would have been like if they came from completely different cultural backgrounds. So between the two of us, we knew quite a lot of writers who were either from different cultural backgrounds or had particular historical expertise in different backgrounds. Uh, and we approached them and the only one in the world is the result. There are 13 stories in the anthology written by 14 authors. Um, the Viking Iceland uh, Sherlock Holmes was co-written by Kerry Greenwood, who writes the Franny Fisher novels, and her partner David Gregg. So the two of them got together and gave us um, what Holmes might have been like if he had been born in Viking Iceland. Um, he doesn't have the name that sounds anything like Sherlock um, because there are no Viking names that sound like that. So I worked with uh, with Kerry and David a little bit just to make him a little bit more Sherlock. He plays a Viking style violin. We have a German Holmes and Watson written by Lisa Fessler from Berlin. Uh, so those characters are actually set in Berlin of 1895, dealing with um, the social issues of that time and things that were going on uh, around Berlin, but also attitudes to homosexuality because the Holmes and Watson in Lisa's story are a couple. We have uh, an ancient Egyptian Sherlock Holmes, Prince Hamahez, written by Dr. L.J.M. Owen, who writes archaeological mysteries. So, you know, her expertise is in showing us a pharaonic era, Holmes and Watson solving uh, the mysteries there. Um, we have uh, an Indian 
Sherlock Holmes and John Watson by Jay Ganguly. Um, so, you know, we've got writers from all over the place, including an Australian Holmes, uh, written by Raymond Gates, who's a horror writer. He's an Indigenous Australian who lives in the US. So he brings that lovely little touch of horror that, um, that Arthur Conan Doyle could bring to some of his stories, including The Hound of the Baskervilles and The Speckled Band. So, you know, this lovely little uh, touch of of those original stories in that original style. Um, one of my favourite stories is uh, by Jason Franks and uh, his wife is Japanese and he himself is uh, from South Africa originally from a Jewish family. So his Holmes is Japanese and his Watson is Jewish South African and it's set in the 1970s during the era of apartheid. So that era and those politics influence them as people as well as the mystery that they're investigating. There are so many wonderful stories. There's uh, a Polish Holmes. There's uh, a 17th century female Holmes based on a real person uh, whose name was Anne Kidderminster. She was born Anne Holmes uh, at a time when there was no police force and she had to investigate her husband's murder because nobody else would do that. Uh, so there's a story with her and a Watson that she meets. One of the things... Uh, the stories have in common because they're, you know, they're 13 very different stories with very different tones. Some are very funny, some are, are very uh, atmospherically moody and the, you know, it's kind of spooky. Uh, there are you know, good, uh, fascinating mysteries and, and puzzles to be solved uh, in all of them. Um, but where they kind of have their commonality is when you go back to the original Conan Doyle stories, there's all these different facets. Holmes and Watson as characters are very textured as characters. There's, there's, there's a lot going on for them. They can be different things on different days, just like any human being. And the stories themselves are told with different tones. So you know, as I said, some of them, you know, feel a little bit like horror stories. Some feel more like adventures. Some are more um, kind of intellectual exercises in um, resolving and under unpacking and resolving a particular strange mystery for someone. So there's all these different approaches to both the storytelling and the characters. And with each of the stories in this anthology, I feel that you, there's always some seed, some link that you can go back and go, that's a feeling, that's a, a note, that's a, a facet of the original stories that's been brought into this story. So you can have 13 really different short stories, but each of them does feel like they echo the original Sherlock Holmes stories, which we love so much. I loved working with all the writers in this anthology. We chose the writers because they had that particular expertise. They either came from a particular cultural background, Irish, German, Indian, that sort of thing. Um, and some had particular expertise, so um, David Gregg working with uh, Kerry Greenwood and his knowledge about Viking Iceland, uh, a subject which he studied, uh, and uh, Dr Owen, who had, you know, as a trained archaeologist herself, had knowledge about ancient Egypt. So those uh, that meant that all these great minds were brought to bear on this idea of changing Sherlock Holmes to reflect a new culture, but also um, still feeling like the original Sherlock Holmes and John Watson. So, you know, it was just such a joy to work with these incredibly talented writers who understood precisely what that meant and were so gifted in giving us um, characters who have different influences, different things that make them uh, tick different concerns that they have, different behaviours and social concerns and um social responsibilities as well so there's that that um expertise goes through everything and it was so wonderful um i can absolutely trust that they knew what i wanted and, that, and they gave me such wonderful stories so it was really exciting working with them all um there's always some challenges as an editor you're trying to make sure that you don't alter too much in the story you're trying to just polish it a little bit to make it the best version of that story can be and of course I was working with some really amazing writers so generally not a lot of editing needed to be done I was very lucky but you know it was it's wonderful to be able to work with people um, and give feedback and suggestions and ideas about how to just tease out a little bit more information make their Sherlock a little bit more Sherlock without altering 
the idea that he's from this different he or she because sometimes we have female Sherlock's and female Watson's as well we also have one Sherlock Holmes which is an artificial intelligence and yet still feels like Sherlock so yeah so it was like it was just such a joy and honestly I didn't find that many challenges um and I yeah everyone was great to work with Um, I've been a writer myself for uh, professionally for over 20 years now. I did not start in the writing industry. Having said that, I've written stories ever since I was little, pretty much since I could hold the crayon, I was starting to write stories. And before then, I was just telling them. So, you know, I've been uh, writing for a really long time. I've got 11 uh, novels of my own out um, so uh, this anthology is sort of a new branch for me and I'm, uh, I've already pitched some new anthologies to my editor which she said yes to so um, I'll be looking at doing some other non-Sherlock um, books f in future uh, and I've done over 30 short stories as well so uh, I, I write songs too um, because in a couple of my books I have characters who are musicians so I've written lyrics that go with that and now I'm working with a friend uh, who's a music producer to uh, to turn some of those songs into uh, from words on a page into actual music that you can hear um, elsewhere so that's been enormous good fun um, so every time I turn around I'm doing some uh, I'm either reading or I'm writing something uh, so yeah this never stopping me I have more ideas than I have time to write Among the other things I've written, uh, my last full-length novel was uh, a book called Kitty and Cadaver, which is about a rock and roll band which fights monsters, uh, but their songs are magic. So this is one of the areas where the songs came from. So some of the songs they sing are just songs, and some of the songs they sing are effectively magic spells, which they use to fight zombies and vampires and ghosts and uh, there's one song that makes it rain um, uh, so yeah there's there's uh, a lot of going on with that one um, that one's all set in Melbourne uh, and I'm hoping to do uh, another book uh, with those same characters uh, at a later time when I've finished all my current projects I've done a few Sherlock Holmes books as well, uh, in which, you know, I'm writing them as a queer couple, so as a gay couple. So I have um, The Adventure of the Colonial Boy, which was set in um, in Australia, in fact, in about 1894. So in the original period of, of the original stories where Sherlock Holmes is meant to be dead, he's missing in action. Watson believes that he died uh, fighting Professor Moriarty at Reichenbach Fall. Um, but no, he was uh, he was chasing down Moriarty's gang. And in this particular story, I've created this idea that um, he sent a telegram to Watson to come and join him in Australia. Um, but, you know, they're estranged. They've they've been fighting because they've been secretly in love for a really long time. But attitudes to homosexuality and um, their own anxieties about that had stopped them acting on anything while in London. So they have a, a mystery to resolve, um, a, a villain to, to chase down and apprehend. And they've got their personal lives to sort out as well while having adventures in the middle of the Australian bush. A more recent one is called A Dream to Build a Kiss On, set in the modern era, so it's a modern interpretation. Um, but in that that particular book, it's a very short book, um, and it's uh, the idea of it, it's 100 ultra short stories. And every short story is exactly 221 words long. And the last word of every short story begins with the letter B. So these are what are called 221B stories. 221 words, B for the last word. And they're all just little encapsulated stories that in A Dream to Build a Kiss on build on to tell uh, a whole story arc. Uh, a modern version of Professor Moriarty. Um, but also um, little... Uh, mysteries and puzzles and cases that they have to solve along the way as well and again this is another um, gay interpretation of the characters so they're also all sorting out their relationship um, after they meet and as that goes along being modern there's uh, different sorts of issues that they're dealing 
with on that. I also have written um, Holmes and Watson in a more traditional sense as well uh, for a lot of short stories and a lot of different anthologies. My personal take is that every interpretation is a valid interpretation and I don't even have only one interpretation. So I write them as straight, I write them as epic best friends, sometimes I write them as a loving couple and different eras. So, you know, before the only one in the world came along, I'd already been playing with or experimenting with shifting um, these characters in time, uh, including one short story where I wrote them as being Australian hipster baristas. So yeah, I'm on that. <laughs> and uh, maybe if we do a second volume of The Only One in the World, I'll put one of my own stories in with my hipster Aussie Holmes and Watson solving crime in Melbourne. I have a few new projects coming up. I always have a few projects on the boil. I'm currently finishing, again, another Holmes interpretation, but actually with a completely different focus. Uh, this, this book called The She-Wolf of Baker Street is focused on Mrs. Hudson, who is a werewolf. Uh, there are a lot of werewolves and vampires and other kinds of creatures uh, in the story. Only Holmes and Watson are actually completely human and everybody else is um, varied. Uh, so I'm uh, I'm actually been publishing that one a couple of chapters a month on uh, on my Patreon, um, but when that's finished, um, I'll be working on the third of my vampire series. I had uh, a book called The Opposite of Life, uh, a vampire book set in uh, contemporary Melbourne, um, in which the vampire is not cool and sexy and you know, all powerful. He's a chubby, um, geeky guy. Um, who wears Hawaiian shirts and is like, yeah, he's he's the worst vampire ever. And his best friend uh, through the course of the first book is a librarian named Lissa. So the two of them become friends while they're investigating a series of murders. Uh, their second book in that series, Walking Shadows, is their, um, uh, in the first book, it's humans who are being murdered. In the second book, it's vampires who are being murdered. So there's a vampire hunter in town and Lisa wants to protect her friend. So that's the uh, the theme of the idea behind Walking Shadows. As soon as I have finished with The She-Wolf of Baker Street, I'll be getting on to the third book in that series called Beyond Redemption. Um, so yeah, it's going to take it into the the next, what I think is a logical sequence of what's happening with Gary and Lisa and the vampires of Melbourne. It can be um, enormous fun being a writer and it can be really challenging sometimes when you've got writer's block or when you've written things and it's you know, you're not sure um, who to send them to or if other people will like them. Um, but this, there's no other way. My best advice, um, the simplest, most basic advice I have for people who are writers is that if you want to be published and you, know, you don't have to be, it's, it's absolutely fine just to write for your own pleasure, to write fan fiction for your community, things like that. But if you want to be a published writer, um, the four basic steps, the most simple steps that you need to do is you need to start writing. You need to finish what you started writing. You need to edit what you've completed so that you can polish it and make it as good as you know how to, how to make it. And then the fourth really vital step is that you need to send it to someone. So you need to submit. Um, it can be difficult, I know. You have to look up different publishers and you know, find out who's taking submissions at the moment. But a good way to get um, through that is to start slightly smaller as well, is that you can have a look and see who is calling out for short stories for anthologies. Um, a lot of people get their start that way and they get their names known to a publisher. So if you write a short story that blows them away and they want for their anthology, possibly that's a short story that is part of a a, a bigger world that you've built, a novel, uh, you know, a, a whole book that you've written. So potentially that's uh, one way to get in. It, you know, don't assume that that's going to be the way in, but you start getting, you know, you can, can get your name out there. So have a look to see what short story competitions are out there, what anthologies are looking for work, um, and then start your story, finish your story, polish your story, and submit your story. Um, the corollary to that, the last thing is always, 
whenever you're submitting a story, whatever the genre, whatever type of thing you're writing, always have a look at the publisher's submission guidelines. It's no good sending them, uh, you know, a, a, a monster killing story if what they're wanting is gentle romance. You need to look at the submission guidelines, make sure you meet and you're giving them what they're asking for because nobody likes being rejected. But as someone who's been an editor, nobody likes rejecting your stories either. What we want is stories that fit what we need and that gets them the first best chance of at least getting read before the next steps may happen. And don't be discouraged if sometimes it takes a while. You know, a, a recent anthology being published by a, an editor that I know, um, she can only publish between um, 13, maybe up to 20 stories in one book, depending on the length of the story. She had 550-something submissions, so there's a lot to get through. But if you make sure you do your best work that you know how, that you've met the submission guidelines and you actually send it in, you at least have a really good chance that your story will be read. Uh, and that, of course, is a, you know, the next step beyond that is hopefully acceptance. Thank you so much for listening to me today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the talk. I, I hope you uh, enjoy the book if you decide to, to read The Only One in the World, which you can get from clandestinepress.net online, uh, but also like any bookshop. And obviously, ask your library to get it in for you. Thank you again. Have a wonderful day, evening, week, month and year. And hopefully I'll see you in person sometime in the future. Bye.